record this. So we've started recording. That's cool. So, <clears throat> hey, we're going to begin this morning with uh, uh, these presentations of what your your uh, intentions are for the projects. Uh, and I hope it's like an interactive thing so people can ask questions about, you know, why a project was chosen or what the technology is, et cetera. Um, but we may as well get started. We'll just go in the order that the teams are on the spreadsheet, unless there's any questions anybody has uh, at the outset. Um, we're good? Okay, great. Um, let's see who's up first. Okay, so Ryan, uh, Brandon, on uh, Echo versus CT, that, that's what your initial thoughts were that you're going to do. Um, if you can, I guess if one of you can take over the screen, uh, make, let me make sure I allow you to do so first. Yeah, it looks good right now. Where, just a minute. I think I, I think you enabled it. I'm not sure why. So share multiple participants share simultaneously. Advanced sharing options. Yes. Is it working? You know what? I want to say one and then all participants, right? There we go. Okay. Um, all right. You can see my screen, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, I cool. can see you and I can see Ryan. You can see his screen. So let, let me make sure. Let me tell him what's going on here. Zooming in. Da, 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 da. For whatever reason, I can't see your screen, which it's probably not. Be sharing it. Maybe it'll open it again. Maybe I stop. Maybe I stop sharing my screen. Where am I here? Oh, I think I might have ended. Hand. Let me try it again. Okay, now I got you. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, that's perfect. All right. Uh, okay. So, um, so our project is going to be on. Um, echocardiography speckle tracking, um, and specifically related to myocardial strain. Um, so my name is Brandon, uh, my partner is Ryan. Um, yeah, so we will be using speckle tracking to measure myocardial strain. Um, we briefly talked about the measurement of strain in lecture two, um, but as a brief summary, um, it is a measurement of tissue deformation, uh, generally calculated in three categories, longitudinal strain, radial strain, and circumferential strain. Um, however, it can also be calculated and represented um, in regional uh, bases. Uh, but most importantly, it provides an effective method for assessing the left ventricle functionality which is very helpful for um, detecting an array of heart diseases like uh, cardiomyopathy and cardiac dyssynchrony. Um, yeah, next slide. So um, speckle is a variable pattern that we see in uh, ultrasound. Uh, which occurs within regions of common tissue where there are microstructures within the tissue. These microstructures are generally smooth uh, surfaces that reflect waves in uh, a number of directions. And this, um, these reflected waves sort of bounce off everything inside of the tissue um, and cause interference patterns um, as they're uh, bouncing off of other nearby structures. And that's why we, that's why um, we see like a lot of this uh, almost noise-like pattern within uh, what should be like a smooth tissue. You, um, do you happen to have a movie of an, of a echo just with multiple frames in your, like what, one of the best ways to show people like what speckle is mm -hmm. 
and why you believe at all that you could track it is to show the coherence over time in in those features right so yeah. if you look at a single as you guys did on a problem set and you tried to measure the wall thickness on a single echo cardiogram it looks just like noise right it looks like all these spiky noise things but the interesting thing about speckle is that those the, a lot of those features move with the tissue right so there's there's some underlying source whatever the hell that is that is there in the tissue and so these things move so i would advocate when you're uh explaining why you think you can track speckle you you show a movie and and say look at these features and they're, they're all sort of moving together mm -hmm. so there's some kind of constant underlying structure in the tissue that's that's right and i'm not sure anybody knows what it is do you in your it would be great if, if you could either state declaratively nobody knows what this is from or here's the top you know you know leading hypothesis for what these where these dots come from i actually think that nobody knows exactly how it's caused but i did read a paper that was talking about how they were able to essentially recreate they found that you could recreate the spe the specific pe speckle pattern for anything oh, yeah. using a I think it was a like um like a uniform pattern of like diffractors right and they were able to generate that so that you could and they and I don't remember exactly how they were using it but it was more of a speckle removal strategy so that you could regenerate um and they were trying to show that you could essentially make it additive noise and then remove the additive noise so you could get a speckle free image um which is a little bit of a different application than what we're doing here right but I think that was the closest that I got to finding somebody that said that they knew how it works so did they create a physical phantom that produced speckle is that yeah I think that's what they were doing in that paper yeah okay um I'm gonna go to the next slide um and we'll we'll have a like more of a better like movie when we have our data set I think for like the final presentation um which <laughs> we're still waiting on the data I think Ryan sent up a sent a follow up email and it sounded like there was another step in the process of getting it. Oh, to get the the actual data that could that is from the same patients that we have echocardiograms and cardiac CTs, CINE CTs from the same patients in about I want to say ten patients and there's probably twenty acquisitions. Some people got two acquisitions and they so they get two echoes and two CTs. Uh, so that it the power of that data is you'll be able to run the speckle tracking on those data and then compare it with say the longitudinal shortening that you measure in the CT mm -hmm. yeah or the you know circumferential shortening you can measure in the CT if you're doing it on the short axis images however you don't need those data to get started on on figuring out how to track speckle right mm -hmm. so there's lots of echo data out in the world that I would probably in trials and stuff like that so um if if this is a bit of a slow process getting these data um you could think of these data as your uh at the end of the process these are your your validation or testing data set right as opposed to we're going to train on these data and um so I would I would look for also an alternative source for echocardiograms and there, there's probably a lot out there you know in like um you know these competitions and things like that okay yeah we'll look for that yeah um so so our plan right now is to essentially take um you know whatever echocardiograph data we can find um and implement speckle tracking using both we found uh like kind of two methods and we're trying to find uh, maybe a couple more that we could compare um but at the moment the ones that we found are Fourier transform based and wavelet transform based yeah um methods um, so I have some wavelet background from another class. Yeah. Um, and for for uh, those of you who maybe don't have familiarity with it, um, the wavelet transform essentially takes um, you essentially take a low pass and a high pass filtered version of an image, and then you downsample by two um, for each of those. And so you get um, essentially you're extracting details um, in the high pass one, or you're extracting the high pass details, and the other one is more of a smoothed image. Um, and then you can do that along the horizontal and, and vertical directions um, and sort of do like this tree where you keep doing it 
um, and essentially every level is another um, right. set of filters, right? Um, so you can extract um, specific details in the high pass and, and low pass and get these um, sort of smaller, but sometimes more useful images. Um, and so usually the biggest advantage of that is that because you're working with these smaller images and you're able to extract these details, you might not need all of these sub images. And so you can do it more efficiently because there's less data to work with. Um, and so that's kind of the benefit of it and um, sort of what we were reading um, with the speckle tracking that used it, um, which wasn't specifically for a myocardial strain, um, was that it did make it faster. I think it cut down the time pretty significantly. Uh, it was kind of surprising how long it actually does take, um, which I think for like the biggest, the the longest case, it was on the scale of like 20 minutes for the Fourier transform based one. Oh, and wow. the wavelet transform one cut it down by I think 50%. Um, so, so I think it, it could have some uses if you were trying to do large data sets for whatever reason, um, or even just maybe uh, for for the the shorter cases if you're trying to do it live, um, having it come out faster um, would be, probably be useful. And so, this wavelet based technique you're talking about, you, you do you also test different basis wavelet basis functions? Like sometimes wavelets are like you know, oscillating attenuated Gaussians with different numbers of lobes and stuff like that. Um, it, I, do you have an intention of doing that or are you just going to pick one that's in the literature they say is the best? Yeah, so that's something that I think we can test. Um, that's one of the things that we're going to do is kind of compare those results um, and see if maybe one of them gives a bias in one direction or another. Mm -hmm. You see what the differences are, um, especially if we don't have the CT data. To, as like a kind of kind of like a ground truth, mm -hmm. um, our comparison will be basically be like this one tends to be a little bit more conservative. This one tends to give you a, a higher estimate, and so I think that's useful for information to have. Do you first um, doing this in both the long axis views and the sh and the short axis views of the echo, or just one of them? Um, we haven't quite figured out exactly how to get. Um, we tended to see like singular values, I think, for myocardial strain, and we're still trying to figure out how these papers get that particular number. Um, so we're still working through that. Um, and I think that'll be one of the determining factors. Um, we did see a lot of times that it was kind of a regional value that they were giving. Yep. Um, so we'll probably stick to that. Um, so my... my you probably in the literature you'll find these regional values are like in sixteen chunks of the myocardium, and they and they're labeled, and you can put them on a on a bullseye. Uh, but your your uh, parameters that you're measuring can come from either a short axis image where you have a donut that's you know going like this, or the the image that's taken from the apex of the heart where you have a horseshoe, and basically in the horseshoe one you you're going to see it shortening down like this and thickening in the orthogonal direction. The donut, you're just going to see it, everything coming inwards. That's the, so there'll be like a radial thickening or, um, but you could also measure sort of shortening in the circumferential direction with the tracking. But I think you're on the, this is, this is looking good. Even if what you do is you say, you compare all of these things and say, look, we get high variability you know, uh, and that's that's not a wrong answer, right? You just give the answer <laughs> that you get, right? If there's high variability, so, so be it. And, um, you know, and then just sort of a comparative chart. And then with the with the case where we have the CTs and the echoes, we can, you could do a, a validation, right? Say, look, mm -hmm. how, how do they compare, you know? But I would get started on on images, you know, sooner rather than later because there'll be yeah. echo there'll be sources of echo images and if you if you're having trouble finding them online or whatever though we can work together and try and find some mm -hmm. okay okay yeah sounds good um the other way that we're going to validate kind of just to make sure that we we're actually doing the kind of the speckle tracking right is the must toolbox which is how we got the image on the last slide okay. um has speckle tracking capabilities um i believe it uses the Fourier transform method and so we're going to Try to do our method by hand and like right. kind of do it do it on our own just so we understand it. Um, but then we can probably just have a sort of like a 
quicker verification using using that to make sure we're getting similar results. All right, cool. That's great. Yep. And that's I'm assuming comes with a citation and a paper and all that stuff, right? Yeah. Lots, yeah. Lots yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's great. I think that's that'll. I look forward to seeing the results. Uh, strain with echocardiography has been shown to be highly irreproducible. <laughs> right. So any any ability to to sort of regularize it is a good thing. Okay, good. Uh, let's move on then uh, to our next project, and that'll be Noah and Shannon are gonna. And we're looking at LA morphology. Uh, that looks at things. Who wants to take the screen? Five, five. Okay. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to. Sorry, speed up a little bit. I I we went a little too long in that one. So we're in. That was twenty minutes. Twenty. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, should I unmute myself and then have? Um. No, let me let me mute my computer and then does that sound right? Okay. Yeah. I I don't know if I, everyone can hear if I mute my computer. Is that because everybody can hear no? Let's me. see. Yeah, I just uh just unmuted myself. Shannon, yeah. can you hear Noah? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, awesome. All right. So do you have sound coming out of your computer then, or is it all me? It's there, but I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. I'll just crank this up. All right, great. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, so my name is Noah and my partner is Shannon, and we are starting a project um, about left atrial remodeling um, in fibrosis after the pulmonary vein isolation surgery. Um, so I'll have Shannon start us off with some background on the procedure, um, and then we'll go from there. Yep. Okay, so the pulmonary vein isolation procedure is kind of what we're going to focus on for this project, and we want it as a means to treat atrial fibrillation. We know that AFib is an irregular heart rhythm that causes poor blood flow through the body, and it can be caused by just various forms of atrial malfunction. Um, so this, this procedure is a common procedure to treat this condition where basically an ablation catheter is inserted into the left atrium, and what that can do is burn or kind of destroy in any way the tissue surrounding the pulmonary veins. So what this can do is because these, these tissue, this tissue around these veins is essentially non-working, it can't transmit electrical signal anymore. The idea is that that electrical signal coming from an atrial fibrillation episode cannot go back up into the veins to be able to come back and like cause more episodes. Um, so that's essentially what that um, procedure is. But we do know that the recurrence after surgery is still pretty prominent at about 21 to 40% or worse. So then going back into it, we also have fibrosis, which is a condition that plays a role in various arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation. So fibrosis is a part of the wound healing process as we know, and it occurs as a means to repair the damage in whichever organ has been injured. So however, um, when fibrosis is prolonged, this can be an issue because it can lead to the disorganization of cells and of ECM components due to this excess deposition of fibronectin and collagen and other aspects of the ECM. And so the issue that can occur here is because the heart is a muscle that needs to be able to expand and contract, when we have this increased deposition of collagen, fibronectin, those types of ECM components, as you can see in the top image on the right, you see a lot of blue and you see how the cells aren't, the cardiomyocytes aren't really as close together to be able to kind of transmit electrical signal, as well as the stiffness of the heart wall being a bit higher, which is going to make it harder for the heart to beat as it should. So this can cause an excess in arrhythmias like AFib. So that's where that correlation kind of plays in. And so we also know there was a study that I found where recurrent AFib in patients with 30% or greater left atrial wall fibrosis was shown to be about 71.4%, which, which is pretty high. So they showed that there was a relationship between the two. Great. Um, so in addition to fibrosis, another characteristic of um, left AFib and the pulmonary vein isolation surgery is that the surgery actually changes the shape of the atrium. 
Um, and we don't really understand the physiological pathways that lead to the atrial remodeling. Um, but the, the hypothesis is essentially when you're burning the tissue in the ablation surgery, you're changing the mechanical properties of it. And then over the next three to four months, while you're healing from the surgery, the heart will reshape itself to adjust for those different mechanical properties. Um, but on a molecular level, we don't really understand how that works precisely. And so there are no studies that predict how the surgery affects the shape um, at you know, three, four months down the line. Um, however, we know that the shape of the atrium is important because there have been studies that show that the shape before you go into the surgery can predict the recurrence, uh, specifically the sphericity and the size of the atrium, um, as well as some more um, complex measurements. Um, but there haven't been really many studies looking at the post-surgery shape. Um, and you would think that the post-surgery shape might be a better predictor of recurrence because that is the shape the atrium has when the recurrence occurs. Um, so it might be a more, you know, a, a direct measurement of what's going on, but it's not really been measured um, very often, partially because it's not very practical. Because um, after these patients get the surgery, um, there's not really any point in imaging afterwards to measure their chance of recurrence. Because it, like, if you if you um, if you measure and you find that they have a fifty percent chance of recurrence, they're not going to go back and like do another surgery after that. The best you can do with that information is basically just watch them. Um, so it's not really practical to image afterwards. But in the couple of studies that we did find that imaged afterwards, um, they found that post-surgery ejection fraction and volume correlated with higher recurrence rates. And so that's what this um, graph is in the top left. I think that's reference 10, um, where in the two groups of patients they studied, one group had higher ejection fraction after the surgery and had about an 80% success rate after four years where the group with reduced ejection fraction had lower than a 40% success rate after four years. Um, so ejection fraction is a measure of movement and shape, um, but th they found other measures of shape that correlated with higher recurrence. So the bottom line is that the shape is important and might, might be a good predictor. So there, can I just ask the question? Yeah. You might have to repeat it so people hear it, but mm -hmm. two things can happen there, right? The atrium can get dilated and, and becomes a big old bag and mm -hmm. therefore the injection practice goes down because it's you know in volume mm -hmm. maximum volume is huge mm -hmm. and second the folks who have reduced left atrial ejection practice likely some of that is caused by reduced left ventricle ejection mm -hmm. right so they so these are sick people whose mm -hmm. ventricle is going down Mm -hmm. And the atrium is just tracking with them. So the question you want to look at when you go back into that citation is say, did they normalize or did they take out the factor of people who have reduced full cardiac injection fraction? Yeah. Yeah. So to summarize, I think the comment is that um, ejection fraction is affected by a ton of different things. It could be the size of the atrium. Um, it could also be the ejection fraction in the ventricle. Um, uh, like a reduced ejection fraction in the ventricle would also, you know, correlate to reduced atrial ejection fraction. So there's a lot of different factors um, that could go into that. All right. So um, to summarize our project aims, that the overall goal is to develop tools that predict AFib recurrence. Um, so we have two main aims, and then a third one that would be fun to do if we could. Um, so the first one is to develop a tool that automatically segments and quantifies the regions of fibrosis in the atrial wall. Um, that could be done you know, pre-surgery and post-surgery, and maybe, maybe a good metric is the change in fibrosis um, caused by the surgery. Um, and then the second aim is to use statistical shape models to describe the structural remodeling that the surgery causes, um, or at least that happens three months after the surgery. Um, so we'll, we'll go into that in, in a future slide. And then a stretch aim is It'd be great if we could take the metrics that we create and actually try to correlate them to the uh, to the recurrence rates of the patients that we have. Um, we've not found their outcomes, but I know that the patient outcomes are out there somewhere. So uh, if we can find them, that would be really fun to do. So uh, Shan, we'll start with the first methods. So for the first aim, we 
wanted to use a tool to detect fibrosis quantification. So we wanted to do this with a semi-automated algorithm and um, delayed enhancement MRI images. So essentially what we would do is we would start by cropping um, the delayed enhancement MRI image of a slice of the atrium. And so what we would do there is then manually segment them. And from the study that we got this method from, they had used something like MATLAB or just anything that could be run through code. And we then decide what we think the atrial wall bounds are, um, which could be a limitation in the study because depending on the um, image quality, it can be hard or easy to kind of figure out what we think those bounds are. Um, but going through with that, once we have chosen what we think the bounds are, the algorithm would be used to find that threshold intensity. And so it would be utilized to assign a threshold intensity, which would correlate to the enhanced or fibrotic voxels of the left atrium. And this would be done through the mean and standard deviation calculations, as well as that pixel intensity histogram that I have put right next to that. And so what this would allow us to do is then create a threshold cutoff at specified standard deviations above that mean to make adjustments. And then we can kind of in that image in the middle at the bottom, we can kind of see the yellow bounds like isolated by themselves. And then at the end of that, after our adjustments are made, we would be able to see highlighted highlighted parts of the image, which in this image are yellow, where we can essentially correlate those to the fibrotic uh, cardiomyocytes. So that would be the method for quantification. Yeah, that's what I was gonna suggest. Uh, yeah, if you can turn off your speaker, we won't get feedback yet. So <clears throat> I followed this technology for 10 years when it was, you know, being done out in Utah for the first time. And, and half, half of the community of EP physicians believed it, or maybe a quarter, and three quarters to a half did not believe it. They thought this was make-believe stuff that these guys are doing. So if you, so when you guys are doing this and you're investigating, okay, how do I segment out? Given that center picture at the top row there, how do I segment out what is, you know, actual infarct in this atrium and fibrosis and what is image artifacts and background and stuff like that? It's okay if your final algorithm you guys come up with doesn't produce something that you believe, okay? So what you want to get out of this is like uh, illuminate and 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 put in a list why is this hard like you should you should at least come out of this with an understanding of like what is the, my probability that this actually is the truth and why is that probability less than one and here are the main reasons right so that i would say that is a goal that is just fine to say that oh yeah for in three weeks we're going to come up with a uh algorithm that you know segments out fibrosis that's a bit, that's a big stretch, right? So don't worry about it. What we're basically doing, um, this was done in a um, Yeah, so this was done in an open access challenge and th this was their published algorithm, like the, uh, this is one of the winner's algorithms. Yeah. And so we're basically just kind of trying to recreate it as right. best we can um, right. with modifications if we, if we run into them. So when so you run it and you see what the, where it goes wrong and stuff like that and where the false positives are and stuff you can probably document the patients that it's going to have trouble with right mm -hmm. it's, it's another thing yeah this is really tricky because the left atrial wall for mr is very small right and these pa patients are breathing over this time because in order to get to an enhancement you have to do a fairly long acquisition it's it's not like 140 milliseconds right it's like seconds to minutes right to get this thing to work so anyway okay um thank you so i'm gonna sort of stumble through this concept it's uh still a little bit new to me okay well you know what this is fun so if we wrote over today we'll just go into Wednesday. okay so i so so that people aren't anxious about the time. Um, if we run over time today, we will eat into Wednesday's class to, to get all the presentations enough time, okay? If anyone's got problems, just, just raise your hand and say, that's okay. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so 
M2 is to create statistical shape models of the atria that we have. Um, so they come with clinician uh, created segmentations. So we have some segmentations already, um, both pre and post surgery, we have 30 patients. Um, so we, we're bringing those into an image pre-processing uh, step. Um, a lot of the segmentations are uh, garbage. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, you could tell that some physicians took more time with them than others. So we're just going back and sort of, you know, correcting a few slices here and there. And then some of them are oriented in the wrong directions or like flipping and rotating those. Um, and then we're bringing them into a software called Shapeworks, which does, uh, which builds shape models. Um, so it, this is kind of a new concept for me, but uh, I'll try to summarize it. Um, so basically what the software does is it takes a segmentation and turns it into a shape. Um, <laughs> And then it creates landmarks, which are these dots that you see everywhere. You can manually assign anatomical landmarks. So here I have the, um, the pulmonary veins marks, and then the software um, generates or it calculates landmarks for all of the atria that you pull in so that every dot cor corresponds to a similar anatomical location. So they're not just random dots, they represent like a physical location. And then what you can do is you can, um, well, we're going to, on the post-surgery shapes, we're going to run principal component analysis on those to get the, the modes of variation, um, the modes of the most variation in the post-surgery shapes. Uh, I've got a video of that on the next slide. Um, and then the other thing we're going to do is going, we're going to export the pre and post landmark coordinates, calculate the displacement vectors so that we have for each patient, the displacement field um, for the surgery. And then we're going to run principal component analysis on the displacement vectors. Um, so that doesn't that that gives us a statistical model of the change in shape, not just the shape itself. Um, so it, you can imagine if, if we take the average of all that, what that could tell us is what is the average way that the shape changes during the surgery, um, and then we'll score each of each patient case against the average, and then we'll get a score for each patient. And that could be maybe a predictor. Um, and then we can also calculate bulk metrics on the displacement field like curl and, and divergence. Um, and then just to show you, um, so th this is one of, this is a statistical shape model of all the atrium that we just sort of compiled. So the first frame is what the average atria looks like. And then we're changing it along one mode of variation. So it looks like it's sort of getting skinny and then spherical and twisting a little bit. Um, so it's moving through standard deviation. So when it gets long and skinny, that's like two standard deviations from the average. And then when it gets spherical, that's like two standard deviations in the other direction from the average. Um, that's cool. Yeah, the, the software is really fun. Because yeah, I didn't have to do like, the software did all this. All that on its own. I guess I have to pause the video before I can move. I think that's it. Yeah. Hey, well, I had yeah. So that this is really ambitious. The the um getting both of these things done in the in a half a quarter where we're at, we're at now. But it's it both of those things look really fun, right? And I think both of those things you'll learn a lot, you know, as to what it can and cannot do. You, know, you don't have to get it to a point and say, oh, now I'm ready to test, you know, a thousand patients and figure that out. But running it on the group of patients that you have to that it went on training on, you will be able to, you know, elucidate what you're confident this thing can do and what it probably can't do. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, the shape-based stuff is very interesting. And like, it, there's a couple of points that come out right away just like do I really need that many points to to characterize the difference between this group and that group you know the group that are going to to recur and not it, it is that it, it almost looks like there's a few too many points on there right they, that we'd start fitting some noise and stuff like that but that I don't you know they probably there's probably somewhere in the literature where they said, yeah, this is the right number that yeah. matches the degrees of freedom of the. Yeah, we can, we can make yeah. it lower. And, um, this was, I was just using the. Okay. Whatever shape. Okay. Yeah, this looks really fun. I, I look forward to, to yeah. seeing the results. That's great. Yeah, and this is a, an outstanding problem in, in cardiac EP. 
is, um, you know, when you get an ablation, it works, you know, roughly 50% of the time. And then some, some people, they go in for a second and then some a third and stuff. And it's, it would be really helpful to know ahead of time for the physician who's going to go in and do the ablation. This is a really tricky one. You've got to burn the heck out of this LA, right? Mm -hmm. And essentially what, what happens on these when they do it sort of iteratively, interactively, and then you watch, you know, they, they look at the timing. The people who get a lot of ablations, you know, have a higher probability of non-recurrent AF. However, when you look at their atrium after this procedure, they've just carpet bombed the thing. Like the thing is just dead everywhere, right? So trying to, you know, hone that down and, and be more specific about what, can you leave any surviving left atrium and have the person not go back into AFib? It's a big deal. So both, both of those are really cool, right? Any questions from the, the group? Okay, uh, let's, so it's David and Isabel and Arthur are, are next. Let's take, take over. Yeah. All right, so um, this might sound a little bit familiar, but we will be talking about left atrium segmentation for CT. It's still loading right now. Is yeah. it good? Yeah. It's good. Okay. Next slide. Uh, CT is an imaging modality that uses x-rays to create images of the human body by reconstruction. Projections from CT, either parallel beams or cone beam x-ray sources while rotating around the body uh, will create some raw data in the form of a sinogram. Sinograms are the 2D array of projections used for reconstructing an image by taking the inverse radon of the sinogram. Uh, from these 2D slices of reconstructed images, sequential data can be stacked to form a 3D image. Dense tissues like bone will appear white, soft tissues will have a grayish appearance, and then cavities with a lot of air will appear black. So an important usage of CT is uh, using this data for visualization, segmenting, and analyzing the tissues, in our case, in the left atrium's anatomy. That would be the chamber body, appendage, four major pulmonary veins, and right middle pulmonary veins. Uh, accurately segmenting the anatomy of the left atrium can be crucial when trying to understand different diseases that are due to structural abnormalities in the heart for different patients. Next slide. So as we know, segmenting the heart in CT is very important. However, it is currently very difficult to obtain these segmentations. Um, in this figure we see, we see a CT slice of the heart, the LV segmentation, and the LVLA boundary marked. All of those are, I don't know if you guys can see it, but I can't see it in the uh, first image. Uh, but thankfully, the uh, in the paper I got this from had a neural network where they had this hourglass shape uh, network, and they can see all of the 3D slices. But for ex experts right now, uh, even with experts going slice by slice, going through the 3D slices, there are so, so many things such as like animat anatomical variations that make it very difficult for those to segment them. It takes a long time. From expert to expert, maybe manually segmenting them takes around one to two hours. So in our project, we'll be specifically focusing on the segmentation of the left atrium because, well, it's important for evaluating atrial size and function, which is important for uh, imaging biomarkers for a wide range of cardiovascular conditions such as like atrial fibrillation, stroke, di diastolic dysfunction. And thankfully we have neural nets on our side. Um, and, but for segmentation with these neural nets, sometimes it can be difficult specifically for their left atrium. There's things like the veins around it and you have to flip it around, look from this side and 
uh, the mitral valve, especially the LA LV boundary, is something difficult for them to uh, determine. Arthur will talk more about this uh, and how we'll be segmenting it and how we'll be evaluating our network. Um, yeah, so pretty much to try to help the network, this is uh, what we'll be using. So, um, or for a bit of context, I did work on automatic segmentation before. Uh, it was, it did focus on LG MRI. Uh, here we want to focus more on LA from C. And so the way it works to try and help the network better uh, segment the LA is that you're going to um, use a first network that is going to try to predict uh, an original segmentation. And then from there, you crop the image to try to uh, locate the region where the left atrium is on the image in order to have a more refined prediction at the end. Um, I won't talk too much about the coding part, but pretty much we, we're going to be using the unit architecture, which is kind of uh, one of the, the most uh, used uh, architecture when it comes to segmentations. Um, so our goal is to uh, use the data that Professor McVeigh uh, provided us with, which is about 50 uh, different patients. Um, we'll need to do some pre-processing because I know you, you have different labels for the different uh, pulmonary veins. Um, the network I did work, use was only one segmentation. So only one label. Um, so oh, so you, were, you will come up with one label for the LA and all the pulmonary veins yeah. and the LA appendage will have one label. Yes. Right. Okay, okay. That's, um, that's cool. yeah. Um, so, so we'll, uh, the, the goal with this project is kind of to see what the influence of like the number of data, like what's good, uh, what we're going to have a little, sorry for that. So we want to analyze the influence of the number of data and see how the pre prediction are, are, are going to. Well, uh, what would be interesting if, if we could run those, uh, atria through Noah's geometry <laughs> generator. Right, and then you and then you try and classify them and say, oh, let's take a, a spectrum of shapes and sizes uh, to train on, and so, you know maybe that'll. Work. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, same. So yeah, um, pretty much uh, one of the most used uh, metric of to uh, understand the quality of the prediction is called the dice score, and the dice score is pretty much going to try to calculate the overlap between the prediction and the ground truth. Um, and so the number is going to range between 0 and 1, with 1 being the a total overlap and 0 being uh, no overlap. And so uh, for the network, uh, the loss function also I'm using is also based on the, the dice score as well. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll uh, so some a little bit of uh, pre-processing in order to make it fit to the network. And then uh, a couple of trainings, uh, which take about a few hours. Um, if it's only it's only the the left atrium, so it takes it has to go through two two networks. So it takes a little bit uh, longer than a typical maybe only one network training. But um, it takes. Can I, can I ask a quick question about the yeah. network? Can you go back to the the network slide? Yeah. And so uh, the UNET on the right-hand side that we're looking at here, which I guess is an, a blow-up of the step two down here, right? Um, yeah, the so two the, steps. The data that you're going to use, is it the full 3D? You're going to give the network the full field of view of, of the left atrium. So that whole box will go in as like a 128 cube or something like that? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. It's a 3D network. And it, um, so there's some kind of, you, you can discuss the benefit of, uh, you know, more uh, like breaking it up perhaps into smaller groups and having more instantiations of that during training versus just doing it as one 3D block, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I think here I'm doing, um, I have to look back at it. I think it's full 3D. But I did do an internship where I kind of wanted, I was doing small cubes, 
Yeah. And I did, I was comparing like 2D um a 2D network to a 3D network, which was interesting because the best score I got was with the 2D network and not the 3D. Okay. But I had like so many parameters I could play with, and one was the size of the chunk I was using to train the network with. Right. So maybe if I changed that, I would have got a better result at the end, but it was, I mean, I didn't have enough time to do it. It was because you you really only had, with one chunk, you, you're kind of limited to yeah. your of training sets, right? And mm -hmm. you're limited to how much you can get into the the array card, right? For the mm -hmm. NVIDIA or whatever you're using. I would make sure you can fit the 128 cube in there. Yeah. <laughs> I I think you can. Yeah, yeah. Play one, right? I, I did do it. I did, uh, like, it, it does work. Uh, so it's 128 okay. cube, so. Okay, um, cool. It is directly. But I, I remember, so uh, during my internship, I couldn't, like, fit the whole image, the whole 3D image. So I had to uh, fit small chunks anyway. Right. Uh, and I kind of play with that a little bit. Okay. So, yeah, and that's pretty much it, I think. Okay, so your, the outcome will be, so you'll train it on N data and see mm -hmm. its performance, then you'll train it on 2N or something and see if it's performance and see if you, if you continue to, mm -hmm. or if, it, if, if you get some kind of asymptotic. Yeah, and, and compared to the same uh, test. Data. Yeah. You know what? Another thing that's very interesting, it's a very interesting problem, is that if you have data that um, is a cine data set, and say you have 10 time frames in your movie of each patient, so then I have 10 left atriums because they change shape over time, right? Uh, but the question is, can you train a network with just one of those, those 10 in each patient and then have the network. So this is like a custom network. It's trained mm -hmm. on, this, on this cohort. And you've trained it on one time frame uh, for each patient. And then now you say, okay, network, go and do the 90% of that's left. You know, because basically when you do them by hand, they all take about the same time. Mm -hmm. And so even though you've got nine time frames left and, and the first one is very similar. It doesn't really matter for the human because the human has to edit and do all the same crap every time. But if you can train it, you know, on say one time frame per patient, or maybe one time frame for half the patients, and then have it do the rest, then you've got this massive leverage, right? So now you can do a movie. Um, anyway, to be honest, I would guess it, it it would perform well because it's kind of just testing it on new patients and. If it's close enough to one of the training sets, of, I believe it would do good, but it's it's an interesting question. I think the, the risk might be it would just give you back the, the one that it did before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Every time frame looks the same. It mm -hmm. just that's, that's mm -hmm. close enough. I memorized this one. Yeah. It's good. You know. Interesting question. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Uh, this is this it itself is also a really important problem uh, because we I have uh, experience at segmenting uh, LAs in CT. And because the left atrium sits at the top of the heart and the pulmonary artery goes right over top of it, and then there's other stuff that, that goes all around it, whenever you do some kind of simple segmentation, it always leaks out into that stuff and gives you, know, gives you yeah. all of these side things that you have to edit off. So uh, all of these things are yeah. really useful. One issue I, I did have with LG MRI is that uh, sometimes uh, it would segment part of the LV because it didn't really see the border with the, the valve. Right. So that was an issue sometimes. Uh, and it would actually do pretty well on the on the pulmonary veins. Not always, of course, but... Uh, yeah. And then the appendage was very, like, had a very high variability between patients. So that was sometimes hard to segment too. Yeah. Well, the appendage, yeah, you're right. It, from patient to patient, it just, it's a yeah. little, little sack. You know, it's, it's a very interesting little thing. But also the LA is very a lot. They're like potatoes mm -hmm. pulled out of the ground. You look at it and go, well, that's a different shape, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Okay, perfect.
Well, we certainly have data. We've been for years building up these segmentations. And I, I predict your network will not have a problem with the mitral valve plane. Uh, no. well, we find from CT, the, the left atrium comes, it, sorry, it comes down into a little cusp at the mm -hmm. mitral valve plane and then the ventricle takes off. And it is really good at getting that little indentation. Maybe on MR, it's a little different. Yeah. But... Okay. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on. Uh, Daniela and Yisali. Hi, um, so uh, it's just gonna be me presenting this today. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so hi, I'm Daniela, and the project topic I'm proposing today is a detailed look into the biochemistry of radio tracers for nuclear medicine. So as we learned in class, nuclear medicine for in vivo cardiac imaging involves two primary imaging modalities, single photon emission computed tomography, or SPECT, and positron emission tomography, or PET. We covered the physics of these in lectures, so I'm not going to go too into detail on that, but generally speaking, both of these modalities use some kind of radioactive tracer that is injected into the patient. This tracer um, gets taken up by body tissues and emits a radiation signal from inside the patient. The signal is then detected by a machine like this with a rotating gantry to produce an image of the heart. SPECT measures blood flow and radioactive signal distribution in tissue to diagnose strokes, seizures, bone illnesses, and infections. Um, it uses a radioisotope like technetium-99 or iodine-123 as the tracer or the probe. Um, this is a picture of the radioisotope technetium-99. PET is used for imaging of certain metabolic processes, blood flow measurements, regional chemical composition, and chemical absorption. Um, different radio labeled tracers target different biological processes and medical conditions like cancer, certain brain pathologies, cardiac events, and bone lesions, um, and can be used to diagnose or monitor treatment progression. So to the best of my understanding, um, I could be wrong, uh, these tracers are compounds labeled with radioisotopes like fluorine-18 or oxygen-15, so it's a little different than SPECT in terms of chemical structure. Um, but this is a screenshot of PubMed structure for a fluorine 18 labeled tracer for PET called fluoroperidase. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, but this is a molecule. So um, its structure is a bit more complex than just a single atom or a radioisotope. In terms of the intersection of nuclear medicine with biochem, uh, Dr. McVeigh was actually the one who first suggested this as a project topic, um, and I was really glad he did because this is actually something I've been wanting to learn more about this quarter. Um, my academic and research background is actually in biomolecular engineering, so during class I found myself wondering how these tracers are taken up preferentially by the body, like how they're able to target specific tissues or pathophysiology of interest because there has to be some mechanism by which this occurs that has to do with the unique cellular and biochemical milieu of healthy versus disease states. Um, and this picture just shows a cool comparison of an in vivo PET scan of an infarcted heart uh, in the axial view uh, with an ex vivo histology study, um, just to demonstrate how the electronically rendered images have an important connection to real tissue and therefore biochemistry. So in terms of the goal of this project, there isn't a medical need that I'm addressing or anything like that. Um, it's really just addressing my own curiosity about how these tracers work and giving you guys a biochemistry perspective on it. Um, I really think this intersection with biochem would provide some interesting context for the physics and computational aspects of nuclear medicine um, and complement class lectures. So uh, my preliminary idea for the approach is to profile some commonly used radio tracers for cardiac imaging and evaluate their biochemical mechanisms, like how they're made, how they permit imaging of various cardiac tissues, and how they're able to identify different tissue states, like normal ischemic or infarcted tissues. 
Um, this will likely involve a deeper analysis of the cellular milieu of different tissues and tissue states. Um, but I'm also interested in looking into how the tech has progressed over the years and if there's any recent biochem advancements, trends, or new tech coming out, because I think this might lead to some interesting findings about the future directions of the field. Um, and uh, for the final output, I will compare and contrast the tracers I looked at and have some kind of table or summary of the information I've gathered, kind of like how websites like PubChem and DrugBank compile information um, from various sources for a specific compound. Um, but I know biochem can get pretty complex, so my goal would be to have this output be bite-sized and easy to understand for people who don't have a biomolecular background. Um, and I'd probably frame the key takeaways and common threads from my lit review in the context of a few case studies of the most impactful radio tracers currently used. Um, in terms of PET versus SPECT, I've started out uh, with looking at PET because just at a first glance, it seems like this might, modality might have a little more meat in terms of biochemistry related stuff, but um, I'm thinking about comparing and contrasting tracers for both if I don't have enough info for a fully fleshed out project. But I think as I'm doing a deeper lit review, um, I'll get a better idea of what a feasible scope is for this project. So uh, Dr. McVeigh, if you or anyone else in the class has any advice on this, um, it would be welcome and much appreciated. So. Um, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, any questions? Yeah, this is a this is a really uh, great project for the course in the sense that every year I, I intend to to like learn about this stuff and and give you know at least twenty minutes on on the biochemistry of how PET tracers are used in in cardiac imaging successfully. And every year I run out of time, so uh, and I don't do it. But if you can do it, that would be absolutely terrific. And then you can teach us, and then I can perhaps modify user slides uh, next year uh, to talk about this. Because when you look at the, the, you know, the horizon of developments in cardiovascular imaging, uh, I think PET cardiovascular imaging uh, has some of the, of the most exciting stuff because, you know, these tracers can give you more biomolecular information than, say, a CT scan, which is mostly you know, just morphology. It's just the shape of things or what, you know, what kind of structures are there in terms of lesions. So what, one thing you might want to look up is the use of uh, PET tracers to image inflammation in vessels, right? So that's one sort of hot topic. The other one is the use of PET tracers to precisely evaluate in the myocardium which tissue is viable. So if you have somebody who has ischemia and they show up in your clinic and you're trying to determine whether or not you should revascularize them to get blood flow back to a certain chunk of tissue, the question is, is that tissue already dead, right? In which case you open a vessel and it, it's just gonna flow into tissue that's being fibrosed. It's, not gonna, it's never gonna recover function. And then that, intervention may be one, a waste of time, two, dangerous, right? Um, so those two things come to mind, but, uh, you know, you're welcome to just scour the literature uh, for the hot topics in, in pet cardiac imaging and, uh, and give those examples too. Uh, but a, a basic understanding of why fluorine 18, you know, is attached to different molecules and how it, it uh, shows you, or why it shows you something's inflamed, et cetera, would be great. So this is, this is terrific. Okay, any, awesome, thank you. Oh, any go questions ahead. in the class? Okay, so uh, Iseli is also gonna give a presentation. So you wanna take the screen, Iseli, and we'll go from there. Oh, okay. Uh, I think I cannot share my screen while Daniela shared. Oh, okay, so Daniela, if you want to try and... Yeah, sorry about that. I forgot. There we go. There we go. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Okay.
Okay. So hello everyone. My name is Yasin Lee, and today I'm going to introduce my project, Deep Learning Based Whole Heart Segmentation in Cardiac CT. Uh, so for first of all, for problem definition, um, accurate computing, modeling, and analysis of the whole heart substructures is important in the development of clinical applications. Segmentation and registration of whole heart images is however challenging and still relies heavily on manual work, which is time consuming and prone to errors. And also, despite the advances in medical images, quali qualitative analysis of images can cause intra and inter-reader variability and clinical applications of medical imaging can be limited. On the other hand, recent advances in machine learning, especially convolutional neural networks, have led to a class of powerful models that show promise to achieve an accurate diagnosis and improve medical decision making. Cardiac MRI and echocardiography are standardly used to determine cardiac function. However, for a growing number of applications, contrast-enhanced cardiac CT scans are also acquired over the whole cardiac cycle. And these have great potential for in-depth cardiac function assessment. Therefore, this project aims to evaluate deep learning algorithms for automatic and robust seg segmentation of the cardiac chambers and mild cardium in contrast-enhanced cardiac CT. So for the data set, the MMWHS data set is a data set for multimodality whole heart segmentation. It consists of uh, 20 labeled and 40 unlabeled CT volumes, as well as 20, 20 labeled and 40 unlabeled MR volumes. And I'm gonna use the CT ones only. And in total, uh, there are 120 multimodality cardiac images acquired in a real clinical environment. Also, the data set provides manual segmentation of the five whole heart substructures as followings. And for the CNN models, CNN has become increasingly pop popular in the field of medical imaging due to their ability to capture temporal or spatial patterns in the input data by exploiting the local connectivity pattern. However, due to ethics and privacy concerns, data acquisition is outdoors for medical data set, which results in insufficient label data for training CNN models. So I plan to design a low complex city CNN model to address the overfitting problem in a small data set caused by insufficient training data and successfully segment whole heart substructures. And for the evaluation, uh, dissimilarity coefficient and average symmetric surface distance will be computed for segmentations at ES and ED. So these are my experiment plan. And first of all, in order to assess the effective effectiveness of our proposed model in automatic segmentation in cardiac CT. I plan to evaluate our model using criteria, matrices, and compare them with other widely used CNN models for medical image, seg medical image segmentation, such as uh, UNAP, fully convolutional network, or fully convolutional ResNet. And these are the arch architecture of the net each network. And second, with the result from first experiments, automatic segmentation across the whole cardiac cycle is the development set in the development set were evaluated against the available reference segmentation in ES and ED basis using the dissimilarity coefficient and the average symmetric surface distances. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, that's that's cool, and I'm glad you found uh, 
a data set, a publicly available data set. So yeah. the NMWHS data, the CT part of that data is, is it multi-phase over the heart cycle? Oh, yes, right. So it has like 10 phases or something like that? Oh, uh, yeah, right. Okay, that's that's really cool. And and so it, it has ground truth for those chambers and the myocardium. Yeah, right. Okay, so I have ground truth data for all those chambers, but not the myocardium, right? So what would be great is if your network gets really good at doing the myocardium, we'll just run it on our data and get the myocardium uh, so that we could have also in our data uh, a label for myocardium, because that's a tricky problem in CT. And the reason that's tricky is when you look at the pictures um, of the heart sitting in the chest, it's sitting on top of the liver, and there's very little contrast between the outside, you know, epicardial border and the liver for a, a, a large chunk of the heart. Uh, and so it's the, there's really low contrast uh, there. You know, if you look at these pictures, you know, in the coronal view at the bottom, see how the heart sits right on top of the liver down there on the bottom left, uh, that, that presents a problem for myocardium a lot of the time. And if you don't have contrast in the right ventricle, the epicardial side of the septum presents, or, or what is inside the RV presents a problem. So this would be great if, uh, if your network actually pulls back uh, myocardium. Um, the data that we're using for the LA segmentation, that data also has LV and a segmentation in it. Uh, I don't know, it has right atrial segmentation and uh, and obviously LA segmentation in it as well. So, you know, you could use some of that for training, but it doesn't have the myocardial label. Uh, it looks to me like these, so the data here is MR and CT at the bottom here. Are these 20 volumes in this data set? Are they both MR and CT? Oh, yes, right. Well, that's cool. Okay, that's that's terrific. If you can email me where this oh, data yeah. is, that would be great. Oh, this is yeah. awesome challenge. Yeah, yeah, that would be terrific. Okay, um, that's great. Oh, it also reminds me one of the one of the slides that that came earlier when we were first talking about uh, deep learning um, showed uh, pictures of the heart. With different segmentations, but they they were upside down pictures. This is this is the issue when computer scientists don't don't look at a, you know a, a paper published in Circulation or or Jack you know imaging or something like that. When you're displaying heart pictures, there are standard ways to display them, and if you display them, you know, backwards or upside down or or the Z is inside out stuff like that, it, it kind of gives away the fact that you're just a computer scientist. <laughs> you know, you're not really a, someone who's doing cardiac physiology. So you want to make sure you display them in the right, right uh, orientation, just as when you're making your slides. So when you're checking like an axial view, like this one here, mm -hmm. uh, you always want the patient's chest on the top, right? And you want their, basically their left arm over here and their right arm over here. Right. That's and you're looking from their feet towards their head. That's the standard orientation that whenever you put your results, stick it in that orientation if it's an axial view. OK, um, cool. Let it, well, this is great. It, I would love to look up this data set, this challenge data set, because uh, it's new to me, actually. And um, and perhaps we can discuss how you could combine that even with some of the data we have in the lab or you can just run with this data either way. Yeah, thank you. Terrific. Okay. Um, let's see who's going next. Um, and Tishna and Jiho. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, Professor. Hi. So we are going to pro uh, present our project, which is on detection of coronary classification, calcification, in which we are doing the calcification detection. Uh, so I'll just pass on to Jihang so that he can explain our project. Cool. Thank you. 
so coronary calcification occurs when the calcium builds up in the plaque found in the walls of the coronary arteries. And this leads to reduced vascular compliance, abnormal vessel motor responses, and impaired myocardial perfusion. And it has been proven that the coronary calcification is associated with the arterial stiffness, which increases the risk of adverse cardiovascular events. And thus, an efficient way to detect small calcium pieces in, is needed for early detection of the coronary microcalcification. Um, even the detection rate of the calcification by CT is like about tenfold greater than that for the of the routine MRI. It's still only capable of detecting relatively later stages of the um, the calcification. Uh, thus, a high resolution micro CT might be needed for this purpose. And the high resolution micro CT has been used for microcalcification detection in the breast, according to this paper. And this group designed the micro CT scanner for breast CT using a flat panel detector using a uh, Feldkamp algorithm with the Shep Logan kernel for all the reconstruction of the CT image. And to test their this scanner, they built a phantom field with suspension made of four agar solution and about 200 micron calcium carbonate grains to simulate the microcalcification in the breast. And then they use a commercial micro CT scanner used in industry to perform a ground truth imaging for their breast CT scanner to be compared to. And to estimate the, de the detectability of the calcification, they use the mean signal profile as a detection template for a non pre whitening NPW matched filter model cal calculation. And the rose criterion is used as a measure for the visibility of the calcification. And furthermore, they explore different ways to use the micro CT data to estimate the detectability, such as uh, using their using the micro CT parameters in a regression model, or like using the micro CT signal profiles as detection template, or using the micro CT data and breast CT statistical properties com combined. And because they are like interested in the breast calcifications and use like a stable kind of phantom model there's like a there's like no motion on the physical model and like the motion if this were to be used on the heart the coronary motion is like not considered so we want to look at the effect of the coronary motion on detecting the coronary calcification and like how their way of like calculating the detectability will be affected yeah so after looking at and reviewing the techniques which have been used in the previous paper, which we just showed, uh, what we plan to do is that we want to do a simple simulation to look at the effect of coronary motion on detecting coronary classification. So uh, basically coronary uh, artery classification in that we have like calciums being collected in our coronary arteries which can like uh, uh, you know uh, indicate coronary artery disease and can be very risky to health so like when plague accumulates could blood flow is like stopped and like uh, if our blood cannot flow through coronary arteries then it can lead to heart attack or chest pain so uh, why are we looking at coronary artery here is because they exhibit motion and in the previous paper they were just looking at breast calcification in which uh, because there is no motion in the breast so uh, here what we plan to do is basically we want to define maybe some motion parameters like amplitude frequency and we also plan to vary the calcification size and then we will collect the coronary artery images and uh, then we'll simulate the coronary motion in which we will define motion models which will uh, have various trajectories based on motion amplitude and frequency and we'll update the position of calcification in each frame of the simulation based on those motion trajectories and after we create those simulations 
presentation, we will create a sequence of such images, which will be representing our coronary motion over time. And then in each frame, we'll be overlaying the calcification onto the static coronary images and save them. And then we'll apply the detection algorithms. We will pick some detection algorithms from the paper and we'll use some other detection algorithms, which might be more suited because the paper does not consider motion into effect and then we'll analyze the effect of the motion which is uh, anticipated direction we want to take for this and uh, yeah so this okay. is what we have planned okay that's that's terrific and and um this is this is a, a really important problem and it's it's not an easy one uh, and remind, I have two papers I can send you, uh, one on the, the change of, of signal as a function of very small drifting motions during the heart cycle uh, for very narrow vessels, which is very similar to a, a small piece of calcium, right? It's like a small signal. And I also have another paper written by a postdoc in my lab who's it's in review right now, so you guys can read that, about as as a piece of calcium, if you model it as a sphere, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, how quickly does the signal go down on your detector? Because that's kind of a, a tricky problem as well. So both those papers will, will help you figure out which part, you know, or how to set up this simulation such that it's quite accurate, okay? And it's, it's a, it is an important problem, especially on the detection threshold for calcium. And I don't think you need to worry about the frequency of motion because during the acquisition itself, the motion you can model is just a drift, right? It's it's either moving like this over the 140 milliseconds or or less, right? You know what I mean? But in one of those papers, there's a really there's some mm. motion models in there that that'll help you, you know, sort of narrow down uh, your your simulation. So okay. we don't need to consider the like the motion affecting the reconstruction you do but the type of motion that you're going to have during your acquisition will be quite simple okay. right it's it's, yeah. it's not going to go back and forth it'll just be like yeah, drifting in one direction basically right okay great i mean this is i think it was this this is more fun than lectures right i i think <laughs> so so uh, I'm really glad to see everyone did a, a bang up job and and looking at these problems. And I think all these projects are gonna wind up being uh, interesting and very useful. So terrific. Any any questions from the from the group before we sign off? Thanks everyone for doing a compact uh, presentation. So we got them all in. Okay, great. Well, we'll return to lectures on Wednesday and please feel free to email about any questions regarding the project that you're doing and whether or not there's perhaps other citations, you know, that, that could inform your uh, work. And, uh, you know, I look forward to working together to getting to the, to some really good presentations at the end. Okay. Great. It's the on Wednesday. <laughs>